Remember, you're in charge, you're the driver. Chances are that the more you step out of your comfort zone into your true sexual nature, the more freedom and joy you're going to find. This takes discernment and courage, of course, and sometimes baby steps are needed to move towards that. Welcome to the Get Your Marriage On podcast. I'm your host, Dan Purcell, a Christian marriage and intimacy expert and coach. I'm on a mission to help couples have the best sex and most emotionally intimate marriages possible. Our episodes cover topics you've always wondered about and are packed with practical advice designed to help you take your marriage to the next level. Last month, I took my family of eight to Costa Rica for a week. It was our first international trip as a whole family. And on one of those days, we went to a nature sanctuary in the heart of the rainforest. At the entrance, we learned that it costs $10 per person to go in and enjoy the trails. They have marked signs and everything, kind of like a self-guided tour of the sanctuary. But if we pay $27 per person, then one of their trained guides will take us through the sanctuary and give our whole family a private two-hour tour. I figured we probably weren't coming back to Costa Rica for a while, so we splurged on the $27 per person option to get a guide. And then we got really lucky. Our guide happened to be one of the founders of the sanctuary himself. He was extremely knowledgeable. We learned all about the amazing leaf cutter ants, rubber trees, and parasitical fig trees. We saw four sloths too, and one of them even was carrying a baby on her tummy. We probably wouldn't have noticed them because they camouflage so well, but our guide knew what to look for. We saw many colorful poison dart frogs too, the most dangerous and huge ant, the bullet ant and a viper, that's a snake. We saw exotic tropical birds, an owl, and toucans. We also saw monkeys, which were really fun to see. Our guide brought a telescope and a tripod so we could take turns getting a closer look at the wildlife he could point out for us. Was it worth it for us to upgrade to get that guide? I definitely think so. Thanks to our trained guide, we saw things that I would have otherwise missed. His training, passion for wildlife, and experience helped our whole family have a better experience and deeper appreciation for the rainforest in Costa Rica. Sometimes we benefit from having a similar guide for our marriages, someone that's passionate, trained, and experienced that can help us point out things that we might otherwise miss ourselves so that we can have a better and more joyful marriage and deeper intimate connection with our spouse. I'm a big believer in marriage coaching. In fact, today is the day I go in for my own marriage coaching session that I have with my coach. And I look forward to these sessions because it helps me step up in my relationship as a better husband and a lover to my wonderful and beautiful wife. You might be curious if marriage coaching can help you in your marriage. Now there's a few ways you can work with me. The first is through my program that I call Next Level. If you go to getyourmarriageon.com website and you click on coaching, that's the program that I offer. It is extremely affordable and full of lots of great value. If you want something more in person, we have retreats. And our next retreat coming up is in October in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area. It's going to be four days, three nights. It's going to be romantic, fun, very connecting. You'll be in a group setting for part of it and also individually one-on-one as we work with you to help you overcome barriers or other things that you want to help you take your marriage and intimacy to the next level. So check out those two programs. Today is a really fun episode that I have planned with you. I emailed my mailing list a few weeks ago asking for anonymous questions, and I got a ton of questions. So today we're going to go through a lot of these great questions that you asked. Now there's a lot of value in asking good questions. First is it opens your mind to other possibilities. Second, it invites you to change, even if it's just microscopic change your lifestyle or your attitude about certain things. Number three, it puts you in a position where you can receive instruction, receive coaching, or whatever it is for you to really level up things in your relationship. All right, let's get into it. First question. I've been celibate my whole life, and I just got married. I'm finding it difficult to be engaged or look forward to sex. Is that common? I'm worried that I've conditioned myself so much to avoid submitting to sexual urges that Even though we can have sex, my body doesn't know it. First of all, congratulations on being married recently. And yes, this is absolutely common. I see it all the time in my coaching, and this can happen. This is when you've conditioned your mind to push sexual thoughts and urges away for so long that you've formed this mental habit. It's become subconscious. You don't even think about it. 
so it's time to break this habit. In a sense, I believe developing your sexuality is akin to developing your spirituality. For example, if you wanted to grow and become a more spiritual person, what would you do? Some examples could include, I don't know, praying more, reading the Bible or other gospel-related literature or sermons, listening to music, associating with others that want to grow and develop their spirituality, and so on. Those are the kind of things you do to grow spiritually. Now, if you want to grow sexually, you probably do some of the things that help you grow sexually too. What kind of music can you listen to? What kind of books can you read? Can you associate with others that have a common goal of growing and developing their sexuality also, and so on? I recommend that you start where you are now and set reasonable goals for yourself to stretch yourself. What does that mean for you? Would it be reading good books about sex, listening to great podcasts such as this one, using an app like Intimately Us, engage in conversations around sex with your spouse using prompts from the Intimately Us app or other conversation starters that you can find? Are there others that that you can look up to as mentors that can kind of help guide you through developing your sexuality? Remember that you've been a sexual being from the day you were born. In fact, before you were born, you were a sexual being. And sex really is a form of adult play. So being playful with your sexuality can help you really move that needle, a big step forward into helping your body awaken to it and enjoy sex in your marriage. All right, second question. I am a 39-year-old woman, and I absolutely love to make love to my husband. But for the past year, it has not been a priority for me because I have just not been, quote-unquote, in the mood. Why has sexual desires dissipated? And how can I get my intense sexual desires back? It makes my husband feel like there is something wrong with him and the way he's performing in bed. And I don't want him feeling that way when it is me and not him. Please help. All right, thank you for this question. And to feel your sexual desires fluctuate a little bit in life is completely normal. I would ask yourself, what has changed in the last year? Could it be sleep, diet, exercise, friends, difficulties in the relationship, new challenges with children at work, perimenopause? What other things could it be that have changed that might affect sex? And maybe you've relied on your body for sexual arousal, which has been really reliable for you up until this point. But now that you're aging, it's going to be a lot more about relying on your mind to generate arousal. And this can be a compound problem. Concern about your husband having a concern about you can definitely add more layers to the situation. For example, when you say, it makes my husband feel like there's something wrong with him and the way he's performing, but you're kind of putting it on yourself to feel like you got to manage his feelings also in this situation can really kind of complicate and compound things. So I recommend it's best to see if you can approach sex with less anxiety about desire in all this. Almost all married couples experience responsive desire eventually. The longer they've been married, one spouse is going to become more responsive or both spouses are more responsive in their desire pattern and nothing's gone wrong. So expect to make some effort to create some space for arousal first, as well as desire will increase. Now, Responsive desire means something sexy has to be going on first in order for desire to show up, rather than the other way around. You're probably used to having desire, and then something sexy shows up. Now you got to put forth some effort to create some sexual context first, and then desire will show up second. Now we can still choose to make intimacy a priority in all this, whether it's sexual intimacy or not. You know, sometimes I don't feel like I'm in the mood to go do my workout in the morning or go on a run, but I do it anyway. And I know that most of the time I feel really good afterwards and I'm grateful I made that choice. It's going to be like that in your marriage sometimes. Another tip that might help you get your sexual desires back is to schedule it. Now that might sound really dumb, but hear me out. What you're scheduling isn't sex per se, but what you're scheduling is a willingness window. This is like, I'm going to set aside time where at least I'm willing to engage sexually in the things I like. For example, what gets you turned on? Is it conversation, the type of conversation? Is it reading something together? Is it massage? Is it getting out your lingerie? Or what is it? Are you willing to at least make one step towards, you know, building more arousal and then seeing where things unfold from there? That's what you schedule. 
And as you do those things, you might find your sexual desire coming roaring back again. There's a lot of wives that have higher desire in their marriage, and they feel like something's wrong with their husband or something wrong with themselves because she's the one pursuing sexually and he's not as much. And that difference causes a lot of confusion for a lot of women. So I'm going to lump those questions all into this one. She says, my husband has a low sex drive, and I feel like women with higher sex drives aren't talked about enough. Any tips or thoughts? And I'd say absolutely, you're right. With our current Western culture, we don't emphasize or normalize women having higher desire or men having lower desire for sure. And I can see why a higher desire wives think something has gone wrong because a lower desire wife or at least a high desire husband is what is most commonly portrayed in all kinds of media. And our culture is saturated with messages that men want sex and men want sex a lot. About 40% of those I work with are in marriages where the woman has the higher sex drive. So I don't think anything's gone wrong if you're in the 40% of women that have a marriage where they're the ones with the higher sex drive. Now, we've done a few podcast episodes on this very topic. Episode 27, back in our archives, is a great one to start. Reasons for your husband's lower sex desire can range widely. There can be upbringing, genetics, our emasculating culture being overweight, stress, diabetes or pre-diabetes, not exercising enough, lack of play in the relationship, self-confidence issues, and so on. There are so many reasons why men have lower sexual desire. I don't particularly understand why your husband has lower sexual desire, but perhaps you can work with him and see if he's willing to try out some things to increase his sexual desire or at least his interest more. Oftentimes, a lot of women I work with take it so personally. She might think, the reason why my husband isn't sexually interested is because he may not find me very attractive. And those kinds of thoughts, I think, are not helpful in creating a better sexual relationship together. So I highly recommend you work together as a team to see how you can really get to the heart of the matter. And most often the time, the reason why he has lower desire has very little, if anything, to do with you. Now, whether you're the man or the woman in your marriage, there's always going to be one of you in the marriage with more sexual desire than the other. It's just a law of the universe. And I believe the same general principles that apply to higher desire wives as they apply to higher desire husbands, with the exception that you're probably fighting against some programming in your brain, you know, that stereotype that men should want more sex, which can feel confusing. So whatever material you can find that helps any individual in the marriage, whether the man or the woman, who has the higher desire to deal with those things in their relationship, will be helpful for you. Those principles still apply. Now, this is another area where I believe why coaching is so valuable, because sometimes our spouse is lower desire because of how we're treating them, and we don't know it. For example, in one of my coaching sessions, I worked with a couple where he had the higher desire in the relationship, she had lower desire. And it's not that she had low desire because she wasn't interested in sex. She just wasn't interested in the type of sex they were having, meaning the way he treated her around sex, it always had to be the kind of sex that he wanted, not the kind of sex she wanted. It had to be done on his time schedule and the way he wanted and kind of demanded that she kind of fold into that. And when she wasn't, you know, he'd get frustrated and then call it out because he's the higher desire and she's the lower desire. But once he learned to really back off, and frankly, calm the heck down and chill out a bit and humble himself a bit and give enough room for two people in that relationship and let her desires prevail once in a while and do sex her way, really like cooperating together and building a sex life they both liked. Her sexual desire like shot right up through the roof. Now they both equally enjoy sex. So I do see situations where our spouse is lower desire precisely because of the way we're treating them. And that can be something that can be exposed and help you work through in a coaching session. Here's the next question. I have a promiscuous past and it holds me back in the bedroom. I'm afraid that he'll think less of me or wonder where I've done that before. It's also hard as my past created a desire for a little bit of aggression, firmness in the approach to foreplay. And he is just so polite and gentle that I have a hard time getting fired up in the bedroom. I'm open to any suggestions about how to overcome these hurdles. 
This is a great question, and there's two parts to this question. The first is dealing with feelings of your promiscuous past, and the second part is wanting a more erotic experience with your husband. Every time you find yourself holding back because of thoughts about your past, you have a few choices to make. The first is to stay in your comfort zone of letting your past define who you are, or number two, let the past stay in the past and courageously step into your full present self. So I believe you still have a choice in how you're going to show up in the moment. And I believe this principle applies not just to, you know, one that has an experienced sexual past, but anyone struggling with, like, say, body image issues or divorced or widowed or remarried or other kinds of things where your past or your current thoughts about your body or your situation affect your current view of yourself in the sexual experience. I also wonder if you're giving your perception of your husband's judgment too much power in your relationship. When you let your fear of what your husband might think of you run the show, you're limiting your sexual self. If I was so afraid what others might think of me as I open my mouth to record this podcast episode, for example, I might never actually uh, show up and create this content that you're listening today. So it's a skill to realize that there is genuine concern of judgment of others but to move forward anyway, despite that feeling being there. It's like driving, but instead of letting that fear be in the driver's seat, you're just letting it be in the passenger seat or in the back seat. Remember, you're in charge, you're the driver. Chances are that the more you step out of your comfort zone into your true sexual nature, the more freedom and joy you're going to find. This takes discernment and courage, of course, and sometimes baby steps are needed to move towards that. The reality is that we all have proclivities or erotic maps, as someone else has said. There are things we just are naturally drawn to sexually, things we find erotic and interesting. And your specific proclivities and sexual interests and what gets you excited erotically for you isn't exactly the same as what will excite the next person. It's really unique to you, just as your personality and fingerprints are unique to you. You say that your past created a desire for more aggression and firmness and foreplay, but I want to offer to you another way to think about it. You say your past created a desire for more sexual aggression and firmness and foreplay, but I want to offer you to think about it a different way. What if your enjoyment of aggression and firmness in sex was always there? It was latent. It was just exposed through your past sexual experiences. And your promiscuous past didn't make you enjoy it but it's just that you discovered it through your past sexual experiences. Who knows? You could have not had a promiscuous past and still discover that you like aggression and firmness in your current relationship and still discover other types of foreplay and other types of play that you find exciting even now going forward. So I'm suggesting you decouple this idea of aggression and firmness that you like in foreplay from being tied to your promiscuous past. Your past doesn't define that you actually enjoy a little more aggression and firmness and foreplay. And another thing for you to think about is perhaps because of your fear of your past, you were motivated to marry someone that's very opposite, someone very gentle and docile and polite. And now that you've been married for a while, you're running into situations where you, you wish your husband was a little bit more aggressive and firm in the foreplay. So let's address the second part of the question. I heard a story about a woman. She's an attorney. She's not only an attorney, but she leads her law firm. So she's the boss. She tells other people what to do. It's a very masculine job, a meaning very masculine energy all day long and high stress, high pressure. And she comes home And when it comes to sex, she does not want to be the boss in the bedroom. She wants her husband to lead. The thing is, she married a very gentle and kind and polite and docile man. Things haven't been going great in the bedroom because she's sick and tired of, you know, bossing people around all day. She doesn't want to boss her husband around in the bedroom and tell him what to do. So she asked him, will you please tie me up? I really want you to, you know, tie me to the bedpost and just have your way with me. And the husband looked at her like, "Uh, I'm the gentle guy. I think that's mean. I I don't I don't want to do that. But she explained, like, look, I just really want to be taken. I want I want you to just be like kind of aggressive with me. Now, this man's a really good man and he extended himself. 
This was hard for him to do, but he did it. And, you know, he had a few blunders along the way, but he kind of got into it and tied her up and had his way with her. And she absolutely loved, loved it. She loved him taking the lead. And it kind of opened up a new chapter, a new uh, way they can enjoy that sexual play together a whole lot more. So I do recommend you open up to your husband. Tell him what you want. Ask him if he'll please be willing to extend himself a bit. Try this out. It may be kind of counter to his nature right now, but is he willing to open up to try this? You might be surprised. It might actually be the ticket to helping you get the sexual relationship you both really crave. All right, next question. I feel like our marriage is changing in negative ways as we enter the middle years of teenagers and young adult children. My husband feels like all is well as long as we have sex. He is somewhat resistant to taking the time to work on something he doesn't feel is broken in our marriage. Any ideas for encouraging him to do something like marriage coaching or counseling with me? Now, I get it. I wonder if he feels like the marriage isn't broken, so to speak. So why fix it? Especially if we're having good sex, right? Why would a husband want to quote unquote waste time on something that he doesn't feel like is a problem for him? My guess is he's hesitant to marriage coaching because he's afraid it's all about fixing him. And he's now a project. I'm not discounting his unwillingness to address things in the relationship he's ignoring or masking through sex, perhaps. But sometimes, We see the flaws in our spouse so much more clearly than we see our own shortcomings and blind spots. I think this is what Jesus was teaching when he talked about the plank in the speck or the beam in the moat. Now, if the roles were reversed and the husband was like, hey, we should go to the gym and get a trainer and a nutritionist so that we can lose some weight and be more healthy and in shape. But what he's really saying is, you're out of shape and you are overweight and you need this help. What if she didn't feel like there was a sufficient problem about being in shape or not, but she feels a subtle pressure and manipulation from her husband that maybe she's not good enough for him? In this situation, I wouldn't be surprised if she will resist doing what he is suggesting about the gym membership. And this is her way of asserting her independence or her autonomy, just for the sake of it, regardless if she needs more exercise or not. We often find it easier in the short term to justify not working on ourselves for fear that maybe those insecurities our spouse is bringing up are true. She might feel like a project in this scenario. There's a popular theory among marriage therapy and marriage coaches that intimate relationships are a system. Think. A system is like an algebra equation where you want things balanced on both sides of the equal sign. So when one person in the relationship starts doing things a little differently or stepping up, It affects the system, you know, the other side of the equation needs to balance out. I've seen in my own experience in my marriage, as well as the couples that I coach, where once one person starts to pull the plank or the beam out of his or her own eye and start to address some of his or her own blind spots, in other words, to really step up in the relationship, a byproduct of that is it puts positive pressure on the other person in the relationship to also step up and change. Now, Of course, there's no guarantee that the other person will choose to step up as a result. They may not, and the relationship may not last if that keeps going on. But my advice for you would be to get some coaching for yourself first. Eventually, your husband might come on board and then sign up for Next Level. That's my program. Okay, last question today. Here are the two questions. I'm going to read them one after the other. Of course, physical toys are exciting and, as I understand it, can be a critical tool to get the level of excitement desired for mind-blowing sex. So what about, quote-unquote, mental toys? What place does erotica, if at all, play in mental sexual excitement? I know personally that my physical sexual response is greatly heightened when it is preceded by seeing something stimulating. How does this get balanced with personal values? And the related question is, It seems that I am only aroused by watching romance scenes in TV shows or movies. I've realized that even though I don't watch graphic sex scenes, I'm exposing myself to a form of porn. I have become convicted to stop watching these movies and TV shows. But now I'm having trouble getting turned on in other ways. Even by my own husband, I've had maybe three orgasms in our last five years of marriage, and I feel defeated. What do I do? 
Now, these are excellent hard questions, and I'm a big believer in living by principles rather than following an arbitrary list of do's and don'ts. So let's talk about a few principles that might help you here. The first principle I want to emphasize is that what you decide to do or not do sexually is a choice between you and your spouse based on the values you hold, and it's not based on what an outside person tells you to do. Another principle is that, in my mind, God does not command us in all things, especially when it comes to sex. From my understanding of the Bible, God is very clear that full sexual expression is between a man and a woman lawfully married. Within that context, though, there's quite a large playground, and there's a lot of flexibility for individuals and couples to explore and define what kind of sex life they want to build within that. In short, I believe God trusts us enough to give us a canvas to explore and find goodness in our sexual relationships. This is why doing a particular sexual behavior, X, works for one couple, but that same sexual behavior may not work for another couple. There's no one-size-fits-all on how to have sex or how to build arousal. It's going to be extremely dependent on the couple, the individuals, the personalities involved, their tastes, their preferences, upbringing, worldview, proclivities, and so on. Opportunities to make choices and use our agency is an integral part of maturing and growing, whether it's in our faith or sexually. It's an important piece of the people-growing machine of marriage. Speaking of goodness, another principle is what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Sermon on the Plain. He says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. You know a tree is good because the fruit is good, just as you know a tree is bad because the fruit is bad. So whatever it is that you're engaging in sexually, look to the fruit. Did it draw us closer together? Are we more excited about being together sexually? How is our marriage bond strengthened because we participated in X, Y, or Z? Another principle is that psychological arousal is a key component to great sex. Sexual imagery, whether in visual or written form, helps individuals generate arousal and sexual desire they won't otherwise be able to generate themselves. I know of many couples that have shared with me that they use sexual imagery, stories, and so on on purpose to help them get aroused, and then they have extremely meaningful and rewarding sexual experiences together. This is the fruit they're after, deep connection, excitement, and arousal for a better sexual experience. Of course, there's discernment here and adhering to the other principles that we've just discussed. I had a guest on my podcast recently, Ashley, And she shared her story about how she finally learned how to orgasm after struggling for many years. The key for her was more psychological arousal. And you can listen to her experience and how it helped her in episode number 121 titled, How I Learned to Orgasm, A Sextimony with Ashley. One more principle is that if you are engaging in a sexual behavior that you feel violates your values, chances are you're not going to enjoy it. For example, If you really don't like the idea of filming having sex with your spouse, you know, that goes against your values, and you do it anyway, even after addressing security and privacy concerns of the video you make, chances are you're not going to be happy with the outcome. You're not going to enjoy the experience. So get clear on what your values are and live in integrity with your values. That will help you enjoy sex. That principle needs to be balanced, though, with the idea of stretching yourself sexually. You'd tell your kids to, you know, try new foods, sports, books, classes, try out for that play, hang out with new friends because you know that it's good for them to stretch outside of their comfort zones from time to time. The same goes for our sexuality. It's good for us to stretch a bit and try new things, including things that might arouse you psychologically. I've personally found that as I age and the couples I coach that are older than me They can't really rely on their bodies to create that physical arousal for them all of the time. In other words, sex becomes a whole lot more mental than physical, and that's not a handicap. You can have incredible, mind-blowing sex because you're engaging your mind, which is your most powerful sex organ. I realize I might get some pushback on this answer. People might use what I said as ammunition to justify pornography use, which I'm not in favor of or open-door romance novels, or whatever it is, I'm not advocating pornography use or any non-concordant sexual behavior for that matter. Building a great marriage is about being great sexual partners that cooperate, not compete against each other, to create outcomes they're both happy with. And a lot of times, this includes engaging in more psychologically arousing items together 
But remember, the key is we're including our spouses in this and we're pushing each other to grow in new ways so that we can have great connecting sexual experiences. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Thank you for these great questions that have been submitted. If you're interested in submitting a question anonymously on my website, you can do so at GarrettMarriageOn.com. I hope you follow us on social media also, because I do address questions anonymously there too. Whatever your question is or struggle, if you'd like something a little more in-depth, something a little more tailored to you and how we can help you specifically, please check out my program called Next Level. This is an opportunity for you to receive coaching one-on-one, getting the help you need specifically in your relationship to get over whatever hurdles that you're struggling with. Or you might have a great marriage and want to join this community of other wonderful couples learning how to take their relationship to their next level and be a part of that conversation. Check it out. It's at GaryMarriageOn.com and you can click on coaching for that information. And again, thank you for listening. I hope you find this information super helpful and please share it with all your married friends. I promise they will thank you for life. <music>